Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your technical moderator for today's event, Eric Bodker. This is a webinar event, so cameras, microphones, and the chat tool are all turned off in this meeting. If you have questions, you can ask them using the Q&A tool on your Zoom toolbar. But please hold your questions until the Q&A portion of today's event. To kick things off, please allow me to introduce Crystal Shannon. Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome all of you to our wonderful presentation that we have for today. We do have a very short program agenda, and I'd just like to go over um, the key agenda items that are listed for you. First of all, we will be providing a short pre uh, overview of our One Book Initiative. Everyone may be familiar with some of the aspects of our One Book Initiative, but we do have some historical aspects I'd like to highlight. And then we have um, an author introduction that will be offered by one of our very own students, Lauren Frick, followed by an exciting presentation by Dr. Amitav Ghosh, followed by a moderated question and answer session by Dr. Doug Swartz, Dr. Ellen Zarletta, as well as Lauren Frick. And then we will have an audience Q&A so that um, you can ask our authors some wonderful questions as well. And then finally, our chancellor will offer some closing remarks for our session. To get us started, I'd like to give uh, just a little bit of a historical perspective about our One Book Initiative. And our One Book Reading Program is actually called One Book, One Campus, and One Community. And this reading program really is intended to build on a experience that we have had on our campus. And it's to build on an intellectual and social rapport that we are trying to establish between our students, our staff, our faculty, and community members through this collective experience of reading, thinking about, and discussing some really challenging subjects and topics related to important social issues, especially those that are surrounding issues about diversity. A common book is chosen to enrich perspectives and invite conversations from a wide variety of different fields of interest. The inspiration for our One Book Initiative actually was inspired out of a similar program that was started in our IU Northwest Campus Council from 2006 until 2010. You can find more information about our program on our IUN website. Since January 2013, our initiative has introduced a different novel for the campus and community to reflect upon these themes and these messages and learning points for this particular book for a period of time. We've looked at books from The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros in 2013 to 2014, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander from 2014 to 2015. Operation Homecoming, which was edited by Andrew Carroll from 2015 to 2016. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot, 2016 to 2017. Conflict is Not Abuse by Sarah Shulman from 2017 to 2018. And then Women in Power, a Manifesto by Mary Beard, 2018 to 2019. We have also explored books that look at our social structures and look at common themes related to how we connect with one another in an environmental as well as a social environment. And our book last year by Hadnif Abardadur Rakib actually was a wonderful example of that where we explored through social events such as music and technologies how we can connect with one another on a different level. Our program goals really are to create awareness and an ongoing dialogue about diversity issues and facilitate this shared learning. We also want to promote positive interactions between not only the students and the faculty and staff on our campus, but as well as within our Northwest community. When we select a book, the book focuses on diversity issues. It's a book that is appropriate for college students and community members to engage in, and a book that also looks at relevant themes and issues that are suitable for group discussion and analysis. All members of the session today are encouraged to complete a post-book event survey and a post-event survey for today's session. And then when you do that, you will be entered into a drawing for a free copy of this year's One Book Selection. 
To speak more on our current selection for this academic year, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Doug Swartz, Clinical Associate Professor of English. Dr. Swartz? Thank you, Crystal. Um, it would seem that our pre-pandemic selection of the Great Derangement was prescient, as it would be hard to say that in the past few months, the extent of derangement has shrunk. Um, and I thought about this last week uh, during the debate when the idea that we should transition away from fossil fuels was reported as a gaffe. Rereading the book recently, I frequently wrote, witness the pandemic in the margins when I read that this is not a crisis happening elsewhere or to others. We saw in this book an opportunity to enter into an extended dialogue with our students, faculty, campus, and community in a multidisciplinary conversation on a most urgent matter. We are living in a time when James Baldwin's great maxim confronts us on multiple and intersecting fronts. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I would say that this means coming together to work towards, as Amitav Ghosh puts it, a way out of the individualizing imaginary in which we are trapped. I would like now to introduce uh, a stellar English major, Lauren Frick, uh, who will introduce Dr. Grosh. Thank you, Professor, Professor Swartz. Amitav Ghosh is the author of many marvelous novels, including Ibis Trilogy, which appeared between 2008 and 2015. It is set at the outset of the first opium, opium war in 1839 to 1841, and includes Sea of Poppies, River of Smoke, and Flood of Fire. Among his other novels are The Circle of Reason and The Shadow Lines from the 1980s and The Glass Palace from 2000. His most recent novel is 2019's Gun Island, which will be the focus of an IUN book group next month. It reprises characters and revisits the setting of an earlier novel, 2004's The Hungry Tide, The Sundarbans, and The Great Mangrove Forest of the Bengal Delta, which Ghost describes in the Great Derangement as a landscape so dynamic that its very changeability leads to innumerable, innumerable moments of recognition. To read his novels is to have one's imagination, understanding, and sympathy is vastly expanded, and he seems a writer for whom the phrase internationally acclaimed has rarely been more apt. He is a recipient of many honors and awards from around the world. His novels are extensively researched and full of adventure and incident, and they are extraordinarily propulsive reading experiences. His recently commented, he recently commented that one of his primary aims for readers of his fiction is that they come away with its, the sense that the world is much stranger than we think and the ways in which our world is changing it is itself very strange, very uncanny and very disturbing. We have to try to grapple with it and make sense of it. So the great derangement, the topic of our discussion today our one book, one campus selection, explores the roles of literature, history, and politics and how they influence our understanding of the current climate crisis. One of the central claims of Ghosh's work is how writing fails to connect with the non-human world. And he argues this is largely due in part to imperialism and the individualistic society in which we live. We are all partaking in the great derangement as we navigate a world where societal conditioning and cultural ideology are constantly permeating our day-to-day -day lives. And much of our response or lack thereof is influenced by our history, politics, and the art and literature that we consume. So with that, welcome Dr. Ghost. We very much appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Lauren, for that very, uh, for that very generous introduction. Uh, that's, uh, it's very kind of you and it's a great, great pleasure for me to be with you today. Um, so uh, I'm going to do a, a presentation about, uh, about my book, uh, and I'm going to start uh, with, a short, uh, with a short video that my Indian uh, publishers made uh, when the book was being published uh, uh, in India. So I have to get my PowerPoint uh, on the screen, so bear with me for a minute. Uh, Yes. Uh, can you see? Uh, can you see my my screen now? Yes, Doctor Ghosh. Everything looks great. Okay, great. So here is the 
here is the uh, the film that they made. Thank you. Thank you. Climate events are very, very difficult to write about. Extreme events, improbable events are very difficult to write about. And I know this myself as a writer. I had an extraordinary encounter with a very, very uh, strange weather event. I didn't even recognize what it was because, you know, we didn't, we in India have very little awareness of um, phenomena like tornadoes. For years afterwards, I tried to write about this event in, uh, in a sort of meaningful way. I tried to sort of even think of incorporating it in my, in my books and novels, and I always found myself struggling with it. I'm a marine ecologist. I've been working in the system quite some years now. And what I can tell you is uh, the oceans are being hit in various ways that you cannot even imagine. Just look at the cost of our seafood production. You know, what does it mean to produce those fish on your table? You know, now the major gear that's used to catch and produce a lot of our seafood is uh, trawl fishers. Now, this is a technique that is really unselective. It's destructive. Uh, you target a few species, but you pretty much catch an entire ecosystem in your net. Now, this not just obviously has an impact on the ecosystem, but it also has a huge impact on livelihoods of small-scale fishing communities that depend on a lot of these fish species and also a long-term sort of survival of that fishery itself. You have all these multiple stressors acting on a marine system okay, that have an impact, as I said, not just on ecosystems but also on livelihoods and you sort of uh, have the overarching umbrella of climate change. Now that is like the recipe for a perfect storm. Just this year, this incredible heat wave that we've had across northern India and across central India, I mean, it's astonishing, unprecedented. It's been a problem modeling the monsoon. So even now, climate models don't all agree on whether the monsoon rainfall will increase or decrease. But what all models agree about is that the frequency of extremes is going to change, which means the frequency of droughts and uh, excess rainfall years, that is going to be changed. Uh, for example, in 2015, you know that uh, we are sitting in Maharashtra. In Marathwada region of Maharashtra, more than 1,000 farmers committed suicide. And you and I were paying more than rupees 200 per kilo of turdal. Now, these are all adverse impacts of the drought. So the question arises, are we adapting to this? And after all, unlike unexpected effects of climate change. Droughts are nothing new. We have experienced droughts for centuries. So we should have been able to adapt. Are we adapting to it? Unfortunately, it appears that we are not adapting to it. And still there are very large impacts on agriculture, economy and so on. If you consider that, you know, Parliament just a couple of weeks ago finally held uh, some uh, a session uh, to talk about the drought and only 80 MPs turned up to discuss what is the most single most important uh, thing that is happening uh, in this country right now. I mean, it really does, in a way, defy belief. The inconvenient truth in climate change is not that climate change is happening, but that climate change is about sharing the economic growth between nations and within nations. I mean, if you look at the most recent uh, sorts of uh, uh, weather-related events around India. You know, so for example, these terrible deluges that have happened in Mumbai in these last uh, eight to 10 years, this terrible deluge that we saw in Chennai, uh, you know, last year. I mean, uh, you know, those things are, are on our doorstep. What does it mean for our cities? It means that we need to design our systems so well that you have much better systems of sanitation you have no water retention that happens in your cities. You're able to design your green areas in ways in which your green spaces can absorb the extreme heat that happens. You need to design your cities so that you can hold the water when it falls. Over the last uh, 150 years or so, the, the 
the direction that literature and literary fiction has taken has carried it away from all sorts of natural engagements. It's carried it more and more towards abstractions of various kinds. It's become, uh, literature has become more and more sort of focused on, uh, on urban areas, on, uh, on the urban experience, on urbanity as such. That to me raises many, many interesting questions. How is it that literature, which in many ways has always historically dealt with the most important issues in the human condition, you know, uh, uh, why is it that literature has turned away from this? In that sense, you could say that, uh, you know, the whole, the whole trajectory of fiction uh, is also imbricated in uh, the same kind of derangement that carries people closer and closer to the sea, where they're so uh, exposed to all these natural impacts. Today, we are voiceless, we are powerless. We are not asking our leaders to step up their game because it concerns us, our present, and our children's future. It concerns the survival of humankind. Uh, so, I'm going to start uh, uh, start reading uh, now, right from the beginning of my book, actually. <clears throat> Who can forget those moments when something that seems inanimate turns out to be vitally, even dangerously alive? As for example, when an arabesque in the pattern of a carpet is revealed to be a dog's tail, which, if stepped upon, could lead to a nipped ankle. Or when we reach for an innocent looking vine and find it to be a worm or a snake, when a harmlessly drifting log turns out to be a crocodile. It was a shock of this kind, I imagine, that the makers of The em Empire Strikes Back had in mind when they conceived of the scene in which Han Solo lands the Millennium Falcon on what he takes to be an asteroid, but only to discover that he has entered the gullet of a, of a sleeping uh, space monster. To recall that memorable scene now, more than 35 years after the making of the film, is to recognize its impossibility. For if there ever were a Han Solo in the near or distant future, his assumptions about interplanetary objects are certain to be very different from those that prevailed in California at the time when the film was made. The humans of the future will surely understand, knowing what they presumably will know about the history of their forebears on Earth, that only in one very brief era lasting less than three centuries, did a significant number of their kind believe that planets and asteroids are inert. My ancestors were ecological refugees long before the term was invented. They were from what is now Bangladesh and their village was on the shores of the Padma River, one of the mightiest waterways uh, in the land. The story, as my father told it, was this. One day in the mid 1850s, the great river suddenly changed course, drowning the village. Only a few of the inhabitants managed to escape to higher ground. It was this catastrophe that had unmoored our ancestors. In its wake, they began to move westwards and did not stop until the year 1856, when they settled uh, again, once again on the banks of a river, the Ganges in Bihar. I first heard this story on a nostalgic family trip as we were journeying down the Padma River in a steamboat. I was a child then, and as I looked into these swirling waters, I imagined a great storm with coconut palms bending over backward until their fronds lashed the ground. I envisioned women and children racing through howling winds as the waters rose behind them. I thought of my ancestors sitting huddled on an outcrop looking on as their dwellings were washed away. To this day, when I think of the circumstances that have shaped my life, I remember the elemental force that untethered my ancestors from their homeland and launched them on the series of journeys that preceded and made possible my own travels. When I look into my past, the river seems to meet my eyes, staring back as if to ask, do you recognize me wherever you are? Recognition is famously a passage from ignorance to knowledge. To recognize then is not the same as an initial introduction, nor does recognition require an exchange of words. More often than not, we recognize mutely. And to recognize is by no means to understand that which meets the eye. 
comprehension need play no part in a moment of recognition. The most important element of the word recognition thus lies in its first syllable, which harks back to something prior, an already existing awareness that makes possible the passage from ignorance to knowledge. A moment of recognition occurs when a prior awareness flashes before us, effecting an instant change in our understanding of that which is beheld. Yet this flash cannot appear spontaneously. It cannot disclose itself except in the presence of its lost other. The knowledge that results from recognition then is not of the same kind as the discovery of something new. It arises rather from a renewed reckoning with a potentiality that lies within itself, within oneself. This, I imagine, was what my forebears experienced on that day when the river rose up to claim their village. They awoke to the recognition of a presence that had molded their lives to the point where they had come to take it as much for granted as the air they breathed. But of course, the air too can come to life with sudden and deadly violence, as it did in Cameroon in 1988, when a great cloud of carbon dioxide burst forth from Lake Nyos and rolled into the surrounding villages, killing 1,700 people and an untold number of animals. But more often, it does so with a quiet insistence, as, as the inhabitants of New Delhi and Beijing know all too well when inflamed lungs and sinuses prove once again that there is no difference between the without and the within, between using and being used. There are, these two are moments of recognition in which it dawns on us that the energy that surrounds us, flowing under our feet and through wires in the walls, animating our vehicles and illuminating our rooms is an all encompassing presence that may have its own purposes about which we know nothing. It was in this way too that I became aware of the urgent proximity of non-human presences through instances of recognition that were forced upon me by my surroundings. I happened then to be writing about the Sundarbans, the great mangrove forest of the Bengal Delta, where the flow of water and silt is such that geological processes that usually unfold in deep time appear to occur at a speed where they can be followed from week to week and month to month. Here I'm going to interrupt myself a little bit because uh, uh, I'm going to show you uh, some footage that I shot in the Sundarbans in the year 2000 when I was, uh, uh, when I was uh, researching my novel The Hungry Tide. I'm just going to let it run in the background uh, while I uh, while I speak to you, uh, uh, while I continue to read, but it'll give you a sense of what the Sundarbans are like. Uh, and there shouldn't be any audio, uh, but if if there is an audio, then please uh, let me know. Overnight, a stretch of riverbank will disappear, sometimes taking houses and people with it. But elsewhere, a shallow bank, a mud bank will arise, and within weeks, the shore will have broadened by several feet. For the most part, these processes are, of course, cyclical. But even back then, in the first years of the 21st century, portents of accumulative and irreversible change could also be seen in receding shorelines and a steady intrusion of salt water on lands that had previously been cultivated. This is the landscape so dynamic that its very changeability leads to innumerable moments of recognition. I captured some of these in my notes from that time, as for example, in these lines written in May 2002. I do believe it to be true that the land here is demonstrably alive, that it does not exist solely or even incidentally as a stage for the enactment of human history, that it is itself a protagonist. Elsewhere, in another note I wrote, here, even, as a even a child will begin a story about his grandmother with the words, in those days, the river wasn't here and the village was not where it is. Yet I would not be able to speak of these encounters as instances of recognition if some prior awareness of what I was witnessing had not already been implanted in me, perhaps by childhood experiences, like that of going to look for my family's ancestral village or by memories like that of a cyclone in Dhaka, when a small fish pond behind our walls suddenly turned into a lake and came rushing into our house. 
or simply by the insistence with which the landscape of Bengal forces itself on, art, on, on the artists, writers, and filmmakers of the region. But when it came to translating these perceptions into the medium of my imaginative life, into fiction that is, I found myself confronting challenges of a wholly different order from those that I had dealt with in my earlier work. Back then, those challenges seemed to be particular to the book I was then writing, The Hungry Tide. But now, many years later, at a moment when the accelerating impacts of global warming have begun to threaten the very existence of low-lying areas like the Sundarbans, it seems to me that those problems have far wider implications. I've come to recognize that the challenges that climate change poses for the contemporary writer, although specific in some respects, are also products of something broader and older, that they derive ultimately from the grid of literary forms and conventions that came to shape the narrative imagination in precisely that period when the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere was rewriting the destiny of the earth. Ah. Um, and now I'm going to read to you uh, another little bit uh, from another part of the book, just a couple of pages. So <clears throat> this is about the birth of science fiction and its relationship uh, to a volcanic eruption. This is the volcanic eruption of Mount Tambora. That's Mount Tambora over there. Uh, near, uh, near uh, uh, well, it's near, it's near Bali, in fact. So here we go. The seismic event that began on April 15th, uh, 1815, on Mount Tambora, uh, three, uh, 300 kilometers to the east of Bali, was the greatest volcanic eruption in recorded history. Over the ne next few weeks, the volcano would send 100 cubic kilometers of debris shooting into the air. The plume of dust, 1.7 million tons of it, soon spread around the globe, obscuring the sun and causing temperatures to plunge by three to six degrees. There followed several years of severe climatic uh, dis uh, disruption. Crops failed around the world and there were famines in Europe and China. The change in temperature may also have triggered a cholera epidemic in India. In many parts of the world, 1816 would come to be known as the year without a summer. In May that year, Lord Byron, besieged by scandal, the, the great poet, uh, uh, besieged by scandal, left, uh, left England and moved to Geneva. He was accompanied by his physician, John Polidori. As it happened, Percy Bysshe Shelley and Mary Wol Wollstonecraft Godwin, who had recently eloped together, were also in Geneva at the time, staying at the same hotel. Accompanying them was Mary Godwin's stepsister, Claire, with whom Byron had had a brief affair in England. Shelley and Byron met on the afternoon of May 27th, and shortly afterward, they moved with their respective parties to two villas on the shores of Lake Geneva. From there, they were able to watch thunderstorms approaching over the mountains. An almost perpetual rain confines us principally to the house, Mary Shelley wrote. One night we enjoyed a finer storm than I had ever beheld before. The lake was lit up, the pines on the Jura made visible, and all the scene illuminated for an instant. When a, when a pitchy blackness succeeded and the thunder came in frightful bursts over our heads amid the darkness. One day, trapped in, indoors by incessant rain, Byron suggested that they all write ghost stories. A few days later, he outlined an idea for a story on the subject of the vampiric aristocrat, August, August Darville. After eight pages, Byron abandoned the story and his ideas were taken up instead by Polidori. It was eventually published as The Vampire and is now regarded as the first in an ever fecund stream of fantasy writing. Mary Shelley too had decided to write a story. And one evening, a stormy one, no doubt, the conversation turned to the question of whether a corpse could be, would be reanimated. Galvanism had, had given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together and endowed with vital warmth. The next day she began writing Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. 
Published in 1818, the novel created a sensation. It was reviewed in the best known journals by some of the most prominent writers of the time. So this is the extraordinary thing. I mean, that uh, 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 the birth of modern science fiction was connected to, the, uh, to a volcanic eruption. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I notice we don't even have the, the little applause emojis that sometimes <laughs> you Zoom. So I will just at this point insert applause, applause, applause. Thank, thank you very you. much. Um, and uh, to uh, in, uh, begin our uh, moderated um, discussion, I will introduce uh, uh, Professor Ellen Sarletta from the School of Public and en Environmental Affairs to pose a question. Ellen? Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for challenging us to think about these connections that exist uh, between our experiences and um, challenging us to try to understand these forces and the consequences of global warming for us in our everyday lives. I um, Technical issue here. Um, your book challenged me to think about and inspired me to reflect on my role as an educator in um, communicating the relevance of the connections between these forces in our lives. And so I'm gonna start out with the first question. And the first question is this, what role, if any, do you think higher ed education plays in imagining other forms of human existence that can help us move through this period that we're in right now? Oh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, let me say, first of all, that, you know, um, it's wonderful to know that uh, all of you as educators are, uh, are engaging with these issues because these are really just the most, uh, climate change is the single most important thing that humanity has ever faced. It's the greatest cri crisis, the greatest challenge. And it's really the uh, young people, you know, people like my children who are now in their late twenties. Uh, and of course you're teaching uh, kids who are much younger than that. They are going to pay the price. They're going to bear the burden. I mean, you've, you've seen already how one planetary crisis uh, like uh, the pandemic really unfolds so terribly upon the uh, lives of young people. It just, uh, I mean, I, I feel just so sad, you know, to see these young students who don't have, you know, uh, those interactions that are so essential, you know, to an education. And, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, we are at a point where things are probably only going to get worse. And we have to really accept that and understand it and try and respond to it. Because even though the pandemic and the climate crisis are not causally related, there's no sort of causal connection between them. They are both uh, cognate phenomena in the sense that they are both effects of the increasing acceleration that the world has seen over the last 30 years. So, you know, the, uh, the lessons of one will apply to the other. So it's not just a climate crisis, you know, it's a planetary crisis composed of many different kinds of uh, impacts, you know, uh, impacts like, if you like, uh, 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 the pandemic and so on. How do we respond to that? How do we teach people how to respond to that? Look, you know, for a long time, the, uh, the sort of, dominant narrative on climate change and uh, and its impacts was that this is going to affect uh, you know poor parts of the world most of all it's going to affect uh, uh, poor people most of all and one of the things that we now see quite clearly is that that is a very very oversimplified narrative you know uh, in many ways the countries that have been worst hit by climate change are not necessarily from the poorest parts of the world. The United States, I would say straight away, is one of the countries that has been worst hit. And uh, uh, more than that, it's the richest parts of the United States that have been worst hit. You take California, you take a city like Houston, it's the fourth largest city in the US. Uh, it's the hub of the global oil industry. Similarly, you take uh, Southeastern Australia, Victoria and so on. I mean, those areas have been very badly hit uh, by climate change. And similarly, if we were to take lessons from this pandemic and see, you know, which are the countries, which are the places that have been worst hit, 
you know, if you look at, uh, you know, crisis assessments of the past uh, done by think tanks and experts, they always say it's poor countries that are going to be terribly hit. Africa is going to go into a major crisis and so on. Uh, in fact, at the start of the pandemic, uh, a no lesser figure than Melinda Gates actually said that uh, she was uh, terribly worried about Africa. It, it, Africa would be in a nightmarish state and so on. But in fact, we find that that's not the case at all. Uh, Sierra Leone uh, has one of the best outcomes. Vietnam has the, some of the best outcomes. Similarly, Taiwan has some of the best outcomes. Uh, generally speaking, East Asia has had much better outcomes than uh, many parts of the world. And which are the countries that have been worst hit? What is the, what is the commonality between them? The, com uh, the countries that have been worst hit, I would say, are actually the United States, Brazil, and India. And one thing, I mean, these are such different countries, but one thing they have in common is extreme inequality. You know, so in inequity, inequality is in itself uh, a terrible vector of, uh, of crisis. And in a situation like this, in, the, in a situation such as this pandemic, and similarly in situations of climate change impact, the most necessary thing will be social trust. And uh, this is actually the thing that we see so clearly uh, within, this, uh, uh, within this pandemic, that it's the countries which, even though the people may not be particularly happy, may not like their governments very much, but uh, you know, there's a certain level of solidarity amongst people whereby they take it upon themselves to limit their own actions to some degree, you know? So as, as educators, I think this is really a fundamental lesson that, uh, you know, that uh, you have to convey to your students that, uh, you know, what will get us through in the end is not technology. It's not any kind of fancy uh, uh, sort of uh, internet breakthrough. It's just old fashioned stuff just old fashioned stuff about living together. Thank you so much. That, um, that segues perfectly to our uh, next question, which is from our student, um, Lauren Craig. Awesome, thank you. So my question is speaking as a, a student, as a young person who's trying to navigate this current moment, I'm often left wondering how do we shift to collective action when it feels like everyone, even activists oftentimes too, are competing against each other to see who can like gain more followers or accomplish more and the divisions between people are consistently getting larger? That is a very good question. That certainly is a very, uh, it's a very good question. It's a very important question. And uh, you know, what can I say? You're right. I mean, in many ways, uh, uh, the way that, things are going. It's like the planetary crisis makes things worse all the time. So if you think back to what January this year was or February this year, uh, Greta Thunberg had, you know, she was gaining millions of followers. She was everywhere. Uh, she was addressing very important uh, meetings. Uh, uh, you know, there was a real momentum uh, behind uh, activists and behind the whole climate activist movement. And uh, that happened also because people could come together, young people could come together in large numbers and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, act <laughs> really. But uh, look at what this uh, pandemic has done. It's made us completely isolated. It's isolated us in our houses. It's made so many kinds of uh, collective action impossible, you know. So yes, I think you are facing, uh, you know, uh, you young people, you're facing a real long-term uh, a problem of activism, of knowing how to respond to this crisis. But there are some, there are some hopeful signs also, and there are some forms of, uh, of action, some forms of organizing that are open to you. I would say here that you take, you look to indigenous peoples most of all, you know. You think of something like the No Dakota Pipeline movement, you know which sustained itself not for one or two uh, meetings or marches or demonstrations, but sustained itself over four years. And, uh, you know, it met with many defeats, but in the end, uh, it also ended in victory. You know, the, uh, the pipeline has effectively been withdrawn uh, by the very company that built it. Uh, 
So I think you really have to look at those movements. You have to try and understand how is it that movements like that are constructed? What brings them together? And I think you see, if you look at the way that those movements are, uh, uh, are organized, they are not like other political movements. They're not like, say, a movement for uh, changing one law or changing um, uh, one policy or something like that. Those movements develop a kind of life of their own. They are really, they develop a culture of their own. They become, in fact, a kind of cultural movement. And that's really what the No Dakota Pipeline uh, uh, movement was about. I mean, they created, they created actually what was uh, at, at one point the fourth largest uh, city in South Dakota. Uh, you know, so many activists came together. And, you know, each of those actions is also a process of learning. I mean, within the, uh, 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 for the, for the No Dakota pipeline encampments, uh, the water protectors, as they call themselves, uh, really were educating each other, not just about uh, politics, but also about their traditions, about what it meant to live on, la uh, on a landscape without permanent structures. You know, in that sense, learning uh, from their indigenous ancestors. And I think, you know, we really have to turn and look at these movements because so many of these movements are genuinely indigenous movements. Like, you know, the whole tree hugging thing began in North, uh, began in North India, uh, in some villages <coughs> in what is now Uttarakhand. And it just took off. It just exploded. And eventually the, gov the government had to back down. So we have to find ways outside uh, politics as usual. You know, we have to find uh, these ideas that uh, really catch your imagination, you know. Sadly, one of the things that's happened with uh, uh, climate activism is that so much of it comes down to sort of, uh, so much of it seems to be about a kind of uh, wonkishness, you know, uh, numbers and, uh, you know, and that's not, it's, let's face it, it's not going to get people excited, you know, it's not going to speak to them we have to find ways to speak to people uh, more directly. And that's really where filmmakers, poets, storytellers are absolutely essential to, the, to a change in consciousness. So the importance of um, understanding cultural movements and uh, their potential value for us for affecting change in the community is clearly a, a theme throughout the book and, and as you just um, emphasized we we can see um fiction playing a role as and if we can see fiction playing that role can you can you give us some specific examples of how that might happen well you know uh, in the great derangement i talk about how um, you know how writers on the whole haven't uh, uh, confronted this crisis, but I think that's really changed, you know, since about 2018. There's been a sort of uh, tide of uh, writing about this crisis since then, and many, many new books have come out. Uh, I get one in my, uh, in my mail about every week. So, you know, I think something has changed. People are genuinely now uh, uh, in a state of absolute alarm about what's happening in the world, about how things are going. So there is, there is a lot of writing. There is, a, if, you, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the most popular serials uh, on, on television, on, on you know, Netflix and so, on, and so on, so many of them are actually about uh, you know, dystopias, futurist dystopias of one kind or another. So I think, I think something is changing. People are recognizing the, uh, the depth and the nature of, uh, uh, what we are confronting. And I certainly think that, you know, uh, writers too are, are, are a part of that. They're beginning to, uh, to confront this, uh, uh, this crisis in a way that they hadn't in the past. Well, that kind of, uh, a, a nice segue to the question that I wanted to switch to, um, because I have read a ton of those dystopian novels. Um, um, and my wife and I have begun to joke that one of the conclusions that we've reached is that in order to prepare for the future, we need to start to cultivate friends with hunters and gatherers and people who have survival skills, um, because that seems like the landscape that we're going to live on. So I want to ask a slightly different question and thinking about the unthinkable of the subtitle in two senses, one of which is, is very prominent in the book and the other maybe is less prominent. 
and the one that is unthinkable that we can't imagine the scale of the danger that and you seem to be saying we're doing more of that but on the other hand we seem to be sort of struck in an unthinkable sense of there's no alternative cycle in which we can only imagine the future as crisis and renunciation and disaster so i wonder if you could say more about hopeful developments in the years since the pub book's publication or how we can blend catastrophic and utopian thinking and getting behind practical policy initiatives and i have to admit that this question is, is somewhat shaped by reading the novels of kim stanley robinson and i think he might add sort of under his uh, sort of voce sort of uh, eco-terrorism i think in, as, as an element uh yes look you know recognizing the crisis <clears throat> doesn't necessarily lead to very good outcomes because you know the one movement that we can see growing now uh, in europe as well as in america is uh, uh, ecological fascism what's now spoken of as eco-fascism you know and uh, there we have to confront also the very mixed legacy of ecology because ecology was in the 19th century founded by uh, well, it, you know, the word was uh, was coined by a German scientist called Haeckel, and out of Germany came this whole idea of a, of a sort of blood and soil nationalism, and it was very closely linked uh, with ecology. And uh, you know, as we go forward, uh, we have to recognize that uh, you know this kind of response to uh, the climate crisis is is coming. It's going to is going to be on a uh, on a very broad scale. You know. And when you when you mention you know people going out to buy rifle uh, going out to buy guns, well we've seen the enormous uh, the enormous increase in gun sales over the pandemic. I think that again is another uh, is another sign of how people are responding. But look, we have to recognize that uh, you know this is happening within the United States in the context of a certain history, you know. Uh, and you in Indiana are more aware of this history, I'm sure, than I am. But you know that, uh, you know, armed mobs have played a very important role in American history. You know, you think of Indian removals, you think of 18, uh, you know, 1838, you think of um, the presidency of uh, Andrew Jackson, what he let loose uh, on, uh, you know, the Indian tribes, the Cherokee tribes that were settled in those areas. And you know, if you think about it, in many ways, they were themselves confronting uh, an earlier iteration of climate change, because uh, they, uh, not climate change in the in the in the present sense, but they were certainly confronting a, an ecological channel a challenge. Uh, their entire ecology was changing around them. So uh, again, you know, I think when we look at what is happening today in the United States. Uh, we can see that one aspect of the American response uh, to this challenge is extreme individualism, you know. So the survivalists that you mentioned, the survivalists think that, you know, the best way to survive this crisis is by, uh, you know, <laughs> building yourself an underground bunker and, you know, arming yourself to the teeth. Uh, which <laughs> seems to neglect, uh, the, uh, you know, the fact that at a certain point your ammunition will run out and your food will run out. And what are you going to do then? I mean, how many years of uh, worth of tin go goods can you can you stock? I mean, uh, this is a part of that whole dystopic imagination. But what this pandemic has also shown us, really, is that uh, there's another way uh, to survive this crisis. And actually, if you travel in East Asia, you know. One of the governments that is most active on climate change uh, is Singapore, because Singapore is very much threatened. And Singapore, uh, you know, they have uh, they have three universities, they have three major environmental humanities programs. I mean, Singapore is absolutely, uh, you know, on board with tackling climate change, and they're tackling it not by uh, not through survivalism. Uh, they're tackling it through the sorts of collective actions that they need uh, to take to protect themselves. Similarly, uh, you know, if you look uh, at some of the uh, Naomi Oreskes uh, and uh, Eric Conway's book on, uh, they call it a novel, but it's a sort of futuristic uh, book of people looking back, scientists looking back from the future on which countries uh, survive this best. 
uh, and uh, those countries are all uh, in East Asia. Uh, so there again, you know, just as with the pandemic, it's really going to be a case of trust, of trust and uh, social solidarity. You know, uh, yeah, uh, to cite one example of this, you know, this sort of individualist ethos uh, served America, served, uh, served the world, if you like, I mean, served people who lived with that ethos very well in, uh, in continents like North America and Australia and so on at a certain point, uh, you know, when there was, when there were abundant resources and so on, and they, you know, you could just create a, a resource based uh, extractivist economy. But, uh, you know, the world has hit, it, hit those limits those extractivist economies just won't work uh, in the future in the same way. And that's where we can see, you know, a kind of uh, general loss of faith, if you like, in what the future holds. And that is for me, I think a very worrying thing because what are we leaving for our, uh, for our children and our grandchildren? I mean, what sort of uh, faith in the future are we leaving for them? Um, can I maybe follow up a little on Ellen's question? You mentioned uh, a lot of new writing. Um, um, can you talk about um, non-dystopian versions of climate fiction that you're aware of? I know you've mentioned in interviews the Overstory, which has a very substantial readership here on our campus. Um, but are there others, or, or could it maybe I can invite you to talk about your own uh, Gun Island, um, which is an actually very hopeful book. Um, and which I, again, I'm inviting people to join a, a Zoom book club um, next month um, as, as, you know, kind of you talked about destroying faith, are there ways of kind of uh, reviving faith or, or, or inspiring um, um, some sort of more hopeful way forward? Thank you. Well, I think, I think, um, uh, I think uh, I would say that uh, Barbara Kingsolver's book, Flight Behavior, is, uh, is, is not at all a dystopic uh, book, a uh, dystopic novel. Uh, I, don't, I think Overstory is not fundamentally a dystopic novel. And what's interesting is that he's uh, engaging with uh, activism, you know, with environmental activism, which again, I think is a very hopeful thing. And in the, similarly, I think, you know, you do find uh, several books of that kind, uh, you know, uh, several novels in which uh, the future is not envisaged uh, uh, in a dis in at all a dystopic way, and I I do hope that there's more and more of that because look, where did faith begin? You know, where did human faith begin? It began by facing challenges. You know, by facing these profound uh, challenges that human beings have had to fa uh, face over you know, our existence as a species. When did faith begin to disappear? It began to disappear, you know, when uh, people thought everything was taken care of, you know, in the late 19th and 20th centuries, when everything seemed regular and normal and everything, there was a, uh, this kind of false promise of uh, endless progress. Uh, and, uh, you know, that it's that world that's crumbling around us today. We've, we've begun to realize that, yes, these were all false promises that uh, modernity itself was fundamentally founded upon a kind of delusion, you know. So I do think that, uh, yes, people will rediscover different kinds of faith. And I think over there, the, the person who really, I think, has turned out to be the great world leader uh, is Pope Francis, you know. In document after document, Pope Francis has really, uh, you know, uh, voiced uh, the anxieties of the world, and he's, uh, you know, I think he's just sim simply the most important voice uh, speaking about these subjects today. There was uh, there was his uh, uh, there was his encyclical Laudato Si, which, to my mind, remains the most important document uh, yet written on climate change. Uh, most of all, because it's written in, uh, you know, it's rhetorically so interesting in the sense of its simplicity. Uh, you can sense his desire to reach uh, ordinary people. In all these ways, he's been, he's been such an important voice, uh, you know, uh, to the world. So there's, uh, you know, Pope Francis is uh, in many ways uh, the person who one can really look to, uh, 
you know, uh, for who? Can I maybe just ask you directly to what extent Gun Island, Gun Island was an attempt to undertake the imaginative task that you saw others neglecting? Um, look, um, dystopic writing, apocalyptic writing is not something that began with climate change. You know, in the, especially in the imaginaries of the Anglosphere, it has a it has very deep roots. It goes back, uh, you know, past the nineteenth century to, you know, it, it goes back a very long way. Uh, so, uh, apocalyptic writing has always existed within, especially within English language writing, uh, in, in the Americas, in England, and so on. And I think it has a lot to do with uh, a certain kind of a Protestant American way of seeing. Uh, of seeing the world, you know, uh, if you if you think of that uh, uh, that wonderful that wonderful poem, uh, "High Flight," you know, uh, which uh, Reagan quoted uh, uh, in his famous speech after the uh, Challenger disaster, where he says, uh, you know, uh, to slip the surly bonds of earth and touch the face of God. You know, the whole idea there is that uh, you know the earth is a surly, uh, terrible place which we would be lucky to leave. You know, so that kind of apocalyptic thinking exists and has always existed very powerfully within uh, within the Anglosphere. This whole idea on which uh, you know these uh, escapist imaginings are founded have been with us for long before climate change, so to speak. So, uh, I, when I started writing, you know, very early on, long before I was aware of climate change or anything like that. I decided that no, I would never write uh, anything that came to an apocalyptic end. Uh, because I simply feel that, you know, I'm from a part of the world where, you know, there are so many uh, poor, desperate, struggling people. I feel that it's, uh, it, it, it's morally wrong, you know, to wish apocalypse upon them. And let's not, uh, let's not, uh, you know, let's not cut corners here. You know, the, the reality is that you you may present your ending in a novel as a as a fantasy or as a as a fiction, but in the end, it is also a kind of wish fulfillment. You know, so I, I I've never written a book that has uh, that had an uh, apocalyptic ending. And actually, I with many of my books, I was sorely tempted. I mean, uh, ap apocalyptic endings are actually often very aesthetically satisfying. Uh, but I always sacrificed that uh, satisfaction uh, simply because I felt that there's an ethical imperative, you know, that prevents you from looking at it that way. You see Gun Island as uh, as optimistic. I wouldn't really say that I see it as uh, as very optimistic, but you know there are possibilities there. And in the end, what happens? I mean, you know, in human lives even in very difficult times, we've always found solace of one kind or, of, um, or another. My, uh, my vision really, uh, the thing that I most take heart from is that in these, difficult, in these difficult times, we are rediscovering the small satisfactions. You know, We are rediscovering what is genuinely important and what is not. Uh, we are discovering that you know, sitting in a uh, sitting in a restaurant with a hundred other people yelling at the top of your voice, uh, you know, is not necessarily enjoyable. It's just uh, it's just a kind of collective delusion of enjoyment. It's actually much better to be at home uh, with your family eating something that you've cooked yourself. So it's it's those small things I think that will see us through. So thinking about fiction and engaging others. It feels like so few people read these days because of something like an unsustainable work schedule or just so many things commanding our attention like social media um, that most people are consuming things that are in bite-sized chunks, um, which is what I'd argue is one of the reasons that images and art are so successful. But how do we use story to reach people who aren't inclined to pick up a book? A uh, very good question. Uh, I think that, that you know, <clears throat> I said so in the Great Derangement, and I really believe this that uh, one of the really disastrous ways in which uh, we started to communicate 
since the beginning of print culture, if you like, but most of all since the 19th century, uh, is this is is this obsessive textuality, this logocentricism, if you like, where uh, uh, we are just completely focused on words to the exclusion of images, to the exclusion of imagery, to the exclusion of other, uh, other ways of thinking about the world. I mean, I remember when I was a child, you know, I mean, if you, uh, if you, read, uh, if you read comic books, it was thought that uh, they would make you stupid. You know, it was thought that pictures made you stupid and that's one of the ways in which I, I think uh, you know our imaginations became if you like um, kind of perverse we thought only words could uh, help the truth whereas now we look around us and we see we need to have our eyes open we need to have our eyes open to relate us to the world we need to have our ears open you know to hear what is happening in the world around us so personally, I feel very much that uh, we have to look towards new literary forms, and those forms are emerging, you know, I mean, uh, uh, there are graphic novels, uh, there, are, uh, there are all kinds of narrative forms uh, on the net that link, uh, that link uh, you know, stories with images in various ways, and which actually allow the, uh, the reader uh, greater uh, greater agency in, in relating uh, uh, to narratives. I think that's one of the reasons why games are so popular because they relate to, uh, they change the, uh, the readers or the, uh, I don't know, the players, if you like, the player's relationship uh, with a text. So for myself, I've certainly been uh, exploring, uh, you know, different ways of working. And actually I have a book coming out in January uh, the book is called Jungle Nama, and it's, a, it's an adaptation of a folktale from the Sundarban. Uh, well, it's more than a folk, folk tale. It's a, it's a kind of uh, religious scripture, you might say. It's about uh, uh, the goddess of the forest and uh, her relationship with tigers and so on. And uh, I've adapted it uh, in verse uh, using the Bengali meter that, uh, that the original was told in. So it's an English adaptation, but it uses a different meter. And when I started this project, I knew I wanted it to be a collaborative project, project in, in which I'd work with an artist. So I've been working with a, uh, with a, a New York based uh, uh, artist. And I have to tell you this, uh, the work he's done has just been breathtaking. So for me, uh, I'm not a, a, a very talented visually. So for me, it was just uh, dis discovering a new dimension, really, how to bring words and images together. And it's been incredibly exciting, really, I would say. And the book will be out uh, uh, next year. And I think you'll see, uh, you know, uh, it's a, you know, this, the story is a very important story in the sense that, uh, uh, in the sense that it brings together uh, a sort of parable of of greed and human limitations and sacrifices and so on. So I think it's a story that's very relevant to the time. So Dr. Ghosh, um, before we move to the Q&A with our participants, I wanna take this opportunity to, to ask the final two questions from, um, from the moderators. And um, my first question is actually related to politics and economic systems. It sounds like your new book is going to be also um, addressing that in part. And so recognizing that our Western culture, uh, in our Western culture, our lives are really anchored in individual freedom and in free markets. Um, do you see a path for transforming those systems? And I know you've given us some good examples from those countries, but do you see a path for transforming those systems so that we can um, actually give agency to nature, and then how important is that to um, to finding our way out of our current uh, circumstances? Well, there are uh, many uh, very important uh, studies and books about how this could be done. Uh, you know, uh, there's an anthropologist called Jason Hickel. He's an economic anthropologist. He's written a very good book on degrowth. And there's, in fact, a whole movement called the degrowth movement, uh, which envisages uh, ways in which economic systems could change for the better. 
Uh, let me say here that, you know, I'm not an economist, I'm not a planner, I'm not a policymaker. So, uh, you know, I'm not a think tank kind of person uh, who can devise these, uh, devise these solutions. But it does seem to me that we cannot move to those solutions without an alternative imaginary, an alternative imaginary that manifests itself in stories and storytelling. I'll give you one example. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read uh, Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Uh, is that the case? Uh, I imagine it is. So Lord of the Flies, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know the story, it's about a group of English uh, school children uh, who e end up stranded on a desert island. And very soon all their civilizational traits break down. Uh, you know, uh, three kids are dead, they fight each other, they, uh, you know, each for himself, it becomes a Hobbesian universe. Now, you know, the, the curious thing is that something very like the Lord of the Flies actually happened in the 1970s. Uh, six uh, teenagers uh, were stranded on a de desert island. But what happened was not at all like Lord of the Flies. Uh, these kids, uh, these boys helped each other, they looked after each other, they built community gardens, uh, they organized their days, they put in, uh, put in place a structure for, uh, for dispute resolution. Uh, they built, uh, you know, they had organized games, they lasted 15 months, you know, on this, on this desert island. It's an incredible story. Uh, the person who rescued them actually wrote a book about it. He was an Australian sea captain. And he wrote that when he found them, they were thriving. Uh, you know, absolutely thriving. They learned how to, how to work with each other. So what does that tell you? A book like Lord of the Flies, and I hate to say this, but Lord of the Flies is on virtually on hundreds of high school reading lists. Why? because it conforms to a certain kind of individualist imaginary, an imaginary that has been in place since Thomas Hobbes. You know, that's how far back we have to go to the 17th century. I mean, especially the, uh, the, uh, the Anglosphere, the, the English speaking countries have been saturated with this ideology so that they imagine it to be reality, you know, but it's not the reality. Those six boys were Tongans, uh, you know, from the Pacific Island of Tonga. That's why, you know, they found ways of working with it. Maybe it's true that if those boys had been, uh, had been English, they would have, uh, you know, become Hobbesian. But in fact, that's not the only way that human beings respond to crises. That's not the only way that they, uh, 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 that they act. There are other ways of, uh, of doing these things. So we have to find the stories that uh, narrate those other ways. And unfortunately, uh, the Lord of the Flies imaginary is going to be with us for a long time still because uh, it conforms, you know, to a dominant imaginary. Yeah, thank you. And, and we have, um, we're, we're going to take, have one last question for you. Um, as it relates to our IU Northwest students, we, we opened by asking you what role, if any, higher education can play in imagining these other forms. Um, and I want to close this section of our program by asking, you know, what do you hope, since so many of our IU Northwest students are reading this book, what do you hope that the IU Northwest students will be able to take away from reading your book and from hearing your talk today? Do you have one takeaway that you'd like to leave with them? Well, the one takeaway I would want them to, uh, to have is really, I hope the book uh, makes them ask questions. Make, makes them ask questions about what they're learning, what they're seeing, why their economics courses are based on this idea that every individual is a, is a sort of rational, uh, is this uh, utility maximizing kind of machine? Uh, why so many of, of our contemporary ideas are founded upon these, uh, upon these imaginaries? So I would just hope that they take away questions. Well, very good. Thank you very much. And, and this is the point where we switch to asking those of you uh, in the audience to, to post questions that you want us to um, ask. And um, 
I'll begin with the one that, that came up first. Uh, there are six questions, but I've got the one in front of me, so I'll read it. Uh, how do you feel about the thought that, especially in the United States, no matter how hard individuals try to save our climate and prevent as much as possible, that our problems will not resolve it themselves, no matter how environmentally conscious we are, unless leading companies that pollute more in, in a day than a single person could in a lifetime are put to an end? Uh, I think that's very good. That's a very good question. Certainly, no one can solve uh, this problem by themselves, and that's exactly why uh, you need to have uh, collective action. Uh, you know, on this, uh, as on so many other uh, massive problems before. Look, at a certain point, people thought that uh, uh, nothing could be done about uh, tobacco smoking. You know, but in the end, uh, people did manage to do something and people prevailed and that was important. In the same way, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, collective action on climate change can really have a very important impact, can really change, uh, or help us change direction. But let's be clear here, you know, a certain amount of climate change is already baked in simply because of all the uh, all the car greenhouse gases that have already been emitted. Our choices now are not about a solution and a problem. You know, the problem, uh, the our choices at this point is between bad and very, very bad, or bad and catastrophic. You know, so do we really want to take the catastrophic option? I mean, while there are other options possible, I feel that we have to do whatever we can. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. The next question posted in the chat is, thanks so much for your outstanding work and talk today. How has your writing and research changed the way in which you think about diet and eating as human activities amidst this growing derangement? Have other writers and thinkers influenced you here? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, um... Uh, certainly, uh, <laughs> a diet is an issue that's very uh, significantly uh, connected with uh, climate change and uh, especially with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. As, you, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, meat farming uh, is, a, is a huge uh, environmental problem because of all the emissions involved, especially uh, methane gas and so on. Look, uh, <clears throat> I think the problem really uh, is industrial agriculture. Uh, it's industrial agriculture that has really created this. Uh, I mean, uh, it's just a, a nightmare in, in, the, in the sense of what the terrible things that it does to animals and also the terrible environmental problems that it generates, uh, you know, for, uh, for all of us. Now, I don't feel that uh, uh, it's for me uh, to impose vegetarianism on everyone because, you know, I'm from India. Yeah, India has been described as a sort of a pastoral plus farming society. So for a lot of farmers, uh, it's, you know, they keep a few goats who roam about on their land. That's not at all industrial agriculture. But uh, those goats and chickens are essential uh, for their diet, for their, for their sustenance. It's not like they're going into a, into a supermarket and buying, um, you know, industrialized chicken or industrialized uh, meat of any kind. Uh, they're growing these animals at home and, uh, you know, uh, they, they absolutely need uh, uh, the, the nutrition. Uh, similarly, so many people, so many uh, poor people are dependent on fish, you know. So I don't feel that, I, I feel we have to be very careful, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this whole thing, not to impose top-down elitist kinds of solutions uh, upon, uh, upon the poor. You know, uh, as Pope Francis says, we have to have solutions which, uh, that enable us to listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. You know, so most of all, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I uh, recently uh, did an event with uh, Sheila Kutz, uh, uh, Walter, who's an Inuit uh, writer and activist and has, uh, you know, done wonderful work up there uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in Canada, in the north, extreme north. Uh, she says uh, that, you know, without uh, a meat, the Inuits would be, uh, they would have nothing to eat because they're dependent. 
uh, on hunting and you know that's their way of life and they don't do it in, in, in an industrial way. They don't waste enormous amounts of food. They don't waste enormous amounts of, uh, of the animals uh, that they hunt. So these are complete, I, I, I think this is a situation where we really need uh, to pay attention, you know, to the many different ways of existence that exist across the planet. Uh, this is a question from coming from the scientists, and I want to uh, put it to you as a non-scientist, but we have been trained, the scientists that is, to report our uncertainty, resist bias, maintain impartiality, and remain independent from advocacy. Yet in terms of the climate crisis, that approach has probably done a great disservice to the, to the fight in progress. How would you envision a more productive relationship between science, policy, advocacy, art, film, literature? <laughs> Good question. Well, yes, I think um, I think it's absolutely the case uh, that uh, you know climate. I mean that scientists of all kinds have been told uh, to separate uh, their role as citizen from their role as uh, as producers of knowledge, and I think we can all see that this is not uh, this hasn't worked out well. In fact, so many leading climate scientists are now also climate activists. James Hansen uh, is the uh, is the best example. Look, you know, I think the one thing that people don't realize is that science, sci scientists have always been involved with politics. Uh, so many, I mean, after all, if you're busy developing a nuclear weapon, I mean, that is a part of a, uh, that is a part of a politics, uh, you know, that is a certain way of, uh, uh, you know, relating uh, to, the, uh, to the political life of the planet. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, uh, there are so many other sorts of technological interventions that have always come out of uh, the scientific community. So that idea that, uh, that scientists have never been involved in politics or have always been separate from politics, is just not the case. Uh, you know, it doesn't conform to any realistic uh, uh, model of the past. But, but I would say that at this moment in time, the division has genuinely completely broken down. Uh, we see so many scientists who are now uh, it's simply that they are just so alarmed, and they can literally see that uh, you know uh, that we are heading towards catastrophe, and they're worried about their children. You know, they're concerned about their children, and uh, I think they absolutely have a right to say what they uh, uh, what they think and feel, and they are doing so increasingly vociferously. All right, here's another question. There's a small but growing movement of Christian evangelicals and young Republicans who argue that we must fight climate change to protect God's creation. Are there other unlikely ally allies that you can talk about? Uh, yeah, there are, uh, there are many kinds of uh, very unlikely allies. I mean, you know, uh, I think a lot of farming communities are increasingly uh, concerned a lot of uh, com uh, uh, communities of fisher folk are very, uh, are very, very concerned. Look, wherever you go on the planet, you know, uh, you can, people know, people know what's happening and people know that it's getting more and more dangerous and more and more uh, concerning for everyone. So, you know, that reality is staring us in the face now. So I think uh, people will continue to uh, uh, respond to this crisis as time goes on. Uh, okay, here's another question. Um, uh, can you name other works of art um, besides books, or, or what what books or art uh, what books or art are, are inspiring you you most right now? Um, to boil the question down. Um, I just have to give you a strange COVID kind of COVID time sort of warning. Uh, I had ordered a delivery which was meant to come at. Uh, uh, at six o'clock, but for some reason uh, uh, they're early today, so they're texting me to say they'll be here uh, soonish. So I may have to just interrupt myself for a minute or two, uh, just to open the door. So uh, please uh, excuse me if that happens. So the books that I'm reading, you know, I've really become very, very interested in, um, uh, especially, uh, I suppose you could say that it's always been an interest of mine, but uh, especially, especially in reading books uh, about. Uh, indigenous thinkers, uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, indigenous writers, activists. 
Uh, and that's that's been very fulfilling for me, uh, really, in recent times, because, you know, it's often said that indigenous peoples around the world, uh, but especially in the Americas, have already faced catastrophe and have somehow found a way of uh, retrieving meaning from it. They've somehow found a way of, uh, you know, keeping themselves together and even th even thriving and flourishing. So I think, you know, this is a moment when people who are very highly educated, like all of us are, uh, maybe overeducated, have to realize that, uh, you know, in many ways, our education has made us blind. It's made us blind to many realities, which indigenous people understood a long time ago. You know, even in the 19th century, uh, there were indigenous leaders in America who were writing, uh, you know, to American presidents saying, a day is coming when you're going to face environmental catastrophe. Are you aware of it? And, uh, you know, in the long run, they, they have been proved right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ghosh, for a wonderful, enlightening, and very thought-provoking and stimulating discussion on this subject. For those of you that have posted a question um, for Dr. Ghosh, if your question was not answered, we will definitely feel free to share those questions with him after today's session. And at this point in time, we are going to begin wrapping up our session today. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm, they're here, so just excuse me for a moment, No please. problem, absolutely. We'll get ready to introduce our chancellor to offer some closing remarks for today's events. So I'd like to introduce the Chancellor of IU Northwest, Ken Awama. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Crystal. And, and uh, um, I hope uh, Dr. Ghosh gets his package of uh, critical uh, and important books are. So uh, thank you, Crystal. And also the um, let me thank all the moderators, Doug uh, Swartz, uh, Ellen Zolata, Lauren Frick for just really just uh, what an incredible uh, experience uh, for me today, listening to my first uh, One Book Initiative uh, event, uh, our, sem our, our seminal annual event and something that I heard about and read about uh, even before I came to uh, IU Northwest. So uh, a special welcome uh, again uh, to, and a thank you to, to Dr. Ghosh. Uh, uh, I think Dr. Ghosh is a, a, f a, uh, um, a former member of the faculty for Queens College at the Senior University of New York. So I, I consider him now a colleague having been from, uh, uh, coming from the City University of uh, New York myself. Um, so great to see you. Uh, and uh, The Great Derangement, I, I, fascinating book is an understatement. When any book makes you challenge your own realities, uh, that is accomplishing something significant. And uh, it's also very relatable to me, uh, Dr. Ghosh, when, when you're talking about uh, many of your personal stories, you know, in, in terms of uh, including your ancestors and fl flooding along the uh, Padma River, you know. And then you s also speak to about Superstorm Sandy, which I lived through uh, living on the New Jersey shore and, and working on Staten Island in, in New York City as well too. Uh, all of those areas were deeply uh, impacted. And, and of course, I've even spoke to so spoke about this experiences and some research about that uh, on here at uh, IU Northwest. But you know, it really is a time in, in thinking about your book and relating it to. It's it's a time for me when uh, looking back, the unthinkable became thinkable, and the and the improbable became reality. But I, you know, I, I read with some, uh, you know, and I think you did it with some amusement that interesting interaction that you had uh, with your mother when you were trying to convince her to move from uh, Kolkata, and uh, she looked at you as though you uh, you had lost your mind. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and I, I was so entertained by that because, you know, after Super and Storm Sandy, very few people left their yeah. their homes. They just rebuilt. They just rebuilt and. You know, it, it aligns with this individualism theme that you're talking about. So instead of the bunker, you know, I'm staying here. I'm st I don't care what happens, and you know, I, I I suspend belief moving forward. And so, and and one of the most fascinating points you you gave me, which was counter in, in uh, uh, counterintuitive to me, uh, Dr. Gosh, was, you know, less of affluent countries as, as we define them socioeconomically they're not really the ones that have experienced necessarily the greatest problems. And so the issue really maybe not be one of poverty or, or it's really one of division, which is yeah. fascinating to me. And, 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 and now I understand, I, I understand better your call for um, collective cultural movements. And that is the way 
uh, to to really uh, change our, our thought process about uh, climate change. So, you know, I think part of that uh, that answer, and some one of our students had mentioned before, is, is really bringing a discussion here, and and you know where we can start uh, making incorporating the unthinkable in, in our teaching and learning here at, at, at IU Northwest. And this also timely aligns with uh, with uh, Indiana University and IU Northwest's uh, sustainability focus, renewed sustainability focus and initiatives, and, and certainly reflected in the book that was your book that was uh, chosen this year. So when you talk about needed hope, uh, Dr. Ghosh, and you talk about small steps, I think this is a great place to start. So I want, on behalf of everyone at IU Northwest, uh, thank you for being here today. And thank you for offering uh, me some compelling things to think about and changing my, uh, my thought process uh, about how I look at these as well too. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor. And uh, uh, thank you to all of you for uh, choosing my book and for this very thoughtful interaction. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to be with you. Uh, it's really been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Okay, goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. And thank you, Chancellor Awama, for those wonderful remarks. We would like to encourage everyone at the end of our event today to please offer us some feedback on the session and ideas for future sessions. You can either immediately scan the QR code that you see in front of you, or a copy of the QR code and a copy of the survey link will actually be posted to our chat for you to go to to provide um, some feedback. All attendees completing the survey will be entered into a raffle for a free copy of the book from today's discussion, so please make sure that you offer that feedback. And then I'd just like to give a final thank you to all of the wonderful departments and the individuals that have helped us put together our, our one book event so far to date. We do have multiple events still um, planned for the future for the rest of this semester as well as the next semester. So please, please, please pay attention to emails that are coming out. We will be providing some additional details on those. And again, thank you everyone for participating in today's event regarding the great derangement. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.